Aircraft equipped with a glass cockpit display, like the Garmin G1000 on the Cirrus here, replace traditional instrument displays with digital screens. The typical orientation is to have two screens, a primary flight display, PFD, on the left, and a multi-function display, MFD, on the right. We'll start by focusing on the PFD. The traditional cockpit, like on the Cessna here, uses the round dial configuration, often called the steam gauges. We're familiar with the big six, primary instruments used for orientation in flight. On the glass cockpit, we keep the functionality of all six of these instruments, and we change the presentation from an analog to a digital one. Each of the six instruments are presented in a different kind of way on the PFD. A seventh instrument, the tachometer, is also visible off to the right on the MFD. The major benefit of this presentation is that the instrument scan becomes less labor intensive because all the information from the big six is visible in one place. Let's take a brief look at each instrument. On the left is the airspeed indication. It's on a vertical bar. The current airspeed, here 158 knots, is shown inside the black rectangle. The attitude indicator is displayed over a virtual blue sky and brown ground with a white horizon line. The aircraft attitude is indicated using three green symbols. The first is an aircraft symbol, the green triangle in the center, and the other two are the green bars on either side which represent the wingtips. The bank indication is displayed by the white arc on the top of the screen. Each white hash mark represents 10 degrees of bank. The pitch indication is on the white horizontal lines running top to bottom, each one representing 2.5 degrees of pitch. The directional gyro or heading indicator is located at the bottom. This representation is a horizontal situation indicator, which you also see on some traditional round dial panels. The current heading in magnetic degrees is indicated in the black rectangle on top at 287. The altitude is shown on the vertical bar on the right side. The current altitude is in the black rectangle, just under 2,000 feet. Like the airspeed indication, this moves up and down to show changes. To the right of that is the vertical speed indication. This black arrow slides up and down to show changes in climb or descent rates. Right now the black arrow is right in the center of the bar indicating zero climb rate. It'll move up and down with changes, to the white bars marked 1 and 2 representing 1 and 2,000 feet per minute respectively of climb or descent. Finally, the turn coordinator and inclinometer, which are combined in one gauge in the traditional configuration, are split up on the G1000. The inclinometer, or ball, is replaced by a white brick below the arrow, indicating slips and skids, while the rate of turn indication is actually incorporated on the HSI, which we'll demonstrate in a moment. And of course, the tachometer is displayed over on the right on the MFD. It shows percentage of power, RPM, and manifold pressure. On the Cirrus G1000, we also have synthetic vision, which shows terrain features. In front of us, we can see the Columbia River, as well as some elevation changes ahead. Not all G1000 units incorporate this. So first we'll demonstrate a level turn to the left. Under IFR, we always aim to make standard rate turns, meaning a full circle in two minutes. This is shown by the little pink arc on top of the HSI, which is the heading trend vector. It shows the heading the airplane will be at in six seconds if the current rate of turn is maintained. A standard rate turn is when the pink arc is on that second white hash mark. At our current speed, around 160 knots, a standard rate turn equates to around a 23 degree bank angle, as shown by the roll pointer on the roll scale. As we roll out of the turn, the brick acts as our slip skid indicator. You should step to the side the brick is in relation to the roll pointer. As we start a climb, we'll pitch up. Our attitude indicates about a 7.5 degree pitch angle we'll see the altitude increase and the airspeed decrease slightly. Have a look at the bars on both sides, which show trend vectors just like the HSI did in the turn, showing where our airspeed and altitude will be in six seconds. As we level off at 2,500, those trend lines disappear and the vertical speed indication slides back down towards zero. The G1000 incorporates navigation information on the PFD using the horizontal situation indicator. We brought up the direct to screen by hitting the direct button off to the bottom right. Here we're going to key in Portland International as our destination using the dial on the bottom right of the screen to select the letters for the identifier, KPDX. 
Then we'll hit ENT twice to activate direct. The display on the HSI updates to show the pink arrow pointing the heading to PDX about 050 degrees and a CDI needle deflected to the right of the course. We'll pick up this track by making a standard rate left turn to 050 degrees. Notice again as we're in the turn that we maintain a standard rate by using that pink arc at the top of the HSI, which is our heading trend vector. And at this airspeed around 160 knots, it's about a 23 degree bank angle. With Garmin Synthetic Vision here in the Cirrus, we can use the flight path marker, that little green circle or meatball which predicts where the airplane is going. If we keep the circle on the horizon where the white line is bisecting it, we'll stay level in the turn. The COM and NAV in the aircraft are displayed in the top right and left, respectively. We can set the Portland Tower frequency in on COM1 by twisting the COM dial and hitting the swap button. We can set a nearby nav aid, the Battleground VOR, into nav1 by turning the nav dial and hitting swap. Be careful here, notice that on the nav, the active frequency is the one on the right, whereas on the comm, the active frequency is on the left. In other words, the active frequencies are on the inside of the display. This is different than a lot of avionics stacks. Also, notice we have the VOR station identified for us with the letters BTG showing up next to the active frequency. Now, in order to track the VOR, we need to switch the CDI mode. We'll do that by hitting the CDI button at the bottom. The HSI goes from tracking the pink GPS navigation to the green NavAid signal. You hear this called a raw data sometimes as opposed to a derived course off a of GPS. Now, just like on a regular VOR HSI, we'll want to twist the OBS, which is here on the CRS knob, until the needle centers. This tells us we need a heading of 007 degrees to track to the battleground VOR. Notice the green CRS indicated here showing the OBS setting, matching where the green arrow on the HSI is pointed. Let's see how we handle altimeter settings in the G1000. If we go into the simulation and change the atmospheric pressure, increasing it to 3016, it's going to cause our altimeter to read lower than our true altitude. We'll want to adjust the altimeter setting by turning the barrow knob, increasing the setting displayed beneath the altitude to 3016. Now, even a glass panel equipped aircraft has to have some standby analog instruments on board. Here we have the airspeed indicator, attitude indicator, and altimeter, and not shown but also required as a magnetic compass. These become primary if we lose our glass display. Here, the standby altimeter setting is coupled to the one on the glass panel, but typically we'd have to independently set this to match what we changed on the PFD. Make sure when you change the altimeter, you're doing it on all of your instruments. Sometimes an adjustment will be needed on the autopilot as well. Let's take a look below the airspeed at the readout for the aircraft's true airspeed. Here it's about 165 knots, while the indicated airspeed is closer to 160 knots. The G1000 is taking outside air temperature and pressure and adjusting the indicated airspeed to true airspeed, so you can put your E6Bs away and let this do the calculation for you. The way the instrument systems work in the G1000 is fundamentally not too different than what we're used to with the steam gauges. We still have a pitot tube and static port. The pitot traditionally connected to our airspeed indicator, and the static port fed the airspeed indicator as well as the altimeter and VSI. In the glass cockpit, the PITO and static ports now feed a piece of hardware called the Air Data Computer, or ADC. The ADC takes PITO and static readings and computes airspeed, altitude, and vertical speed. It also takes outside air temperature readings and calculates true airspeed. The three attitude instruments, the attitude indicator, turn coordinator, and directional gyro, are replaced with an attitude heading reference system, or AHARS. The AHARS is fed data from accelerometers, which are computerized sensors measuring movement in three axes. Almost every smartphone now has some of these accelerometers or video game controllers for some examples. Directional information comes from a magnetometer, which digitally detects magnetic north for the HSI. The Air Data Computer and the AHARS both live behind the panel of the G1000, along with a good deal of other hardware that make up the system. The learning curve on glass cockpits like the G1000 is a bit steep at first. But once you're comfortable with how it works, it'll greatly reduce the workload that goes into an instrument scan, and as we'll see, will make incorporating automation even easier. 
Did you like this video? You're going to love Flight Insight IFR Ground School. Hours and hours of videos just like this, as well as hundreds of practice test questions based on the real thing with instructor feedback. Head on over to flight-insight.com slash IFR right now.